Hi, I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. Certainly a lot going on in the country today. It's great to be joined by Derek Johnson, President and CEO of the NAACP. What's up? Good to be here. Good yeah. to have you in New York. How's everything going? Everything's going good, considering the state of the nation. Yeah, yeah. certainly a lot yeah. to talk about. And today is a really sad day. We lost Elijah Cummings and somebody that just fought for people in a way that was really profound. And when you heard the news, what was your reaction? It was sad. Uh, a very strong voice in Congress. Uh, he had evolved to become a congressman for all of the people, not just the residents of his district. He was a thought leader in Congress. Uh, he, was, he was a person who understood the procedures, the rules, uh, and considering the critical nature of what's taking place around the question of impeachment, mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the go-to individuals to make sure all of the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted. And he was one of those strong voices that wasn't afraid to share his opinion, especially against President Trump, especially against injustice. And for somebody like you, that really must have resonated as well. Absolutely resonated. Uh, a member of the NAACP, mm -hmm. of course, but he was an advocate. He was an advocate for his community before he got elected to Congress. He was an advocate uh, when he, in his profession as a, as a lawyer. Uh, and he came from a very humble beginning, uh, a, a parent of sharecroppers. And so he understood the, the power of voice, the need to advocate for those who could not speak for themselves. Uh, and, and he was also a person who respected the Constitution mm. and, 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 the, and the, the promise that the Constitution had, not only for African Americans, but for everyone. Is there a little memory that you hold on to when you think about him or just his legacy in general? Yeah, you know, when I, when I began to look at history and, and other uh, scenarios where Congress had to consider articles of impeachment, uh, Barbara Jordan stands out. Mm. Uh, and he truly was the Barbara Jordan of the time, uh, someone with a very clear voice who understood the significance of the office of the presidency, someone who understood the significance of Congress taking on articles of impeachment, but also someone who understood the rule of law and how he was able to navigate uh, his value and appreciation for the Constitution and, and this nation of America, but also hold up that against uh, making sure that the Commander-in-Chief is held accountable mm. to the Constitution and the people. Yeah, definitely. So see, he's somebody that really respected history, understood it. You're certainly somebody who falls in that category, your organization as well. When you think about the country in 2019 today, what is the most jarring thing that sticks out to you and what needs to change in your mind? Well, you know, the current political climate, the fact that racism and intolerance is germinating from the White House, something that many people thought we had got beyond. Mm. You know, if you can recall the 20, 2008 election, people started talking about a post-racial society. Yeah. And here we are in 2019, we are far from a post-racial society. Uh, we are in a society where a foreign nation has interfered in our elections in seeking to suppress the black vote, and yet nothing has happened. Uh, current political and climate where the loss of civility is so prevalent uh, when you look at, uh, at, at policymakers, particularly in the House and the Senate, unable to have true civil conversation to come to solutions. Uh, the loss of civility when it comes to the broader conversation when, when the current occupant of the White House uh, has been shown by the Washington Post, wherever he have a rally, uh, racial hate crimes go up by over 200%. Uh, that's, a current, uh, that's a climate in 2019 that we as a nation should not tolerate. We know what this means from a historical context and for the NAACP is the very thing that we have to fight against. There's been a lot that's changed obviously since Donald Trump has been elected. When you think about the country, what have been some of the scarier moments and when you've talked to people, what have been some of the reactions just in their everyday lives where things have actually changed yeah. for them? So you know, last year we did a, uh, a survey of our members and the number one thing that jumped off the page is, is the level of fear because of what people understand in terms of the direction of this country. Uh, 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 intolerance, uh, the lack of civility, racism, the fact that we were uh, stand for taking children from parents at the border mm. and do it in a way in which we are hard to reconnect the parents and the children. Uh, the fact that we are entering a period where the impact is something that we're going to see for a couple of decades with the appointments of federal judges right. who are appointed for a lifetime. Uh, those are the things that are most jarring, more, most concerned to our members and I think most concerned to many Americans. One of the big topics for you guys also was DACA and the Dreamers mm -hmm. and you actually sued President Trump in the White House for that. Why was that something you guys did? And have you guys done that in your history? Like, is that have you sued a president for something like we that? We have. We, yeah. we, 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 as an advocacy organization, 110 years old, we understand that when you, when this nation give a promise, and citizens and and individuals rely on that promise, that promise should be upheld. And from our history, the Dred Scott case is mm -hmm. is a close analogous to DACA, that when the Supreme Court said a black person. Uh, lack any rights a white should have to uphold. That was jarring 
because mm. the Constitution says something different. When we go through a civil war and Africans pick up arms to reinforce Union troops, and we get the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment, and then within 12 years, all those things are turned on its head. We look at segregation emerging across the country. That is a jarring experience. When we, we walk into a civil rights movement and we realize that, that the Constitution, the promises therein, were not being upkept, and we had this thing called the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. The first time was a threat of a March on Washington, which forced the uh, federal government to integrate in 41. The next one was carried out by A. Philip Randolph and by Russia because of the unfulfilled promises. That's a, that's a jarring reality to us. So when we see DACA, and DACA is not just about Latinos, it's about no. people who come here without any control. They were brought here by parents. They were brought here and said, if you comply with the, this roadmap, then you can stay here. That's only fair. That's a contract. And for the NAACP, this nation should not break their contracts. Yeah, no question about it. So Long answer to your yeah. question. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, I appreciate it. So like you the other day, I'm watching the Democratic debate, and I saw you had some tweets there. And it, it feels like, for you at least, there are certain issues that are still not being talked about enough. Voter suppression yes. is one thing. Civil rights, police brutality. Why do you think these questions aren't getting in mainstream debates, and how do we change that conversation? You know, for me, it's, it's a conversation I need to have with the networks who are hosting these debates. There is no reason you have a debate in Ohio. A state over the last 12 years had more vote suppression activity than the state of Mississippi or Alabama. Mm. And yet there is no true question around access to voting, voting right, or vote suppression. There was only one member on that stage who raised it, but it was not a, a dominant conversation. This is most enlightening with, when, you, when you compare that with the fact that African Americans truly is the base vote in the Democratic primary. So if those individuals on stage are seeking to win the primary for the NAACP, for our constituents, for the African American community, we need to hear them talk about our issues and how they're going to prevent uh, this democracy from being subverted through the suppression of black votes. So we're seeing some people with endorsements coming out. Is that important for you guys to do something in the near future, or do you want to wait a little bit more to see how things shake out? We don't endorse. We're nonpartisan. Uh, uh, we don't support candidates or political parties, but we advocate on issues. And so mm -hmm. what we would like to see more of the candidates talk about the issues that are of concern to the NAACP and the African American community. Uh, that's what's important. It is about access to voting. Our franchise is something we fought many years for. It is about quality education. Education is something we fought many years for, and all children should be provided uh, quality education. It is about student loan and the debt cycle that we're putting people in. Yeah. That's something that's important for African Americans. It is about housing. And I can go on and on and on. We want candidates to speak to that, and then we can evaluate individual by individual uh, their merits of what they truly represent our needs and interests. So we've talked about a lot of things plaguing the country. When you think about your time with the NAACP, what are you most proud of in terms of what you guys have accomplished or conversations you've had that have led to positive change? You know, I'm most proud of some of the most recent court victories we've had. I'm most proud of the number of young people who are engaged. Uh, we are at a heightened period in this nation of young activists being engaged. And many of those activists have decided to choose NAACP as their vehicle of voice. And that's really important. For me, that's telling me that the, this 110-year organization can survive another 110 years because we've opened up the doors to allow people to engage uh, irregardless of their generational uh, uh, positioning. When you think about President Trump and his term so far in the White House, what do you think about and what kind of bothers you the most about his term so far? I think what bothers me the most about his term is the fact that he has a term at all. Mm. Uh, he should not be in the office. He is woefully unqualified. Uh, he's allergic to knowledge. Uh, he's someone who, when you look in the mirror, uh, that's the only thing he can see. And anybody who look opposite that, he has no respect for. Uh, it, it, I, have, I would have never imagined that someone of his makeup will serve in the highest office in the land. Especially coming from President Obama. And like you said, like we were talking about a post-racial society, and obviously, looking at reality, maybe that was a little bit far-fetched, but still, those were the conversations we were having yes. not that long ago. Think about how much has changed just in a couple years here. Yeah. It's really wild. And, you know, the fact that you have someone serving an office where you have to question the veracity of every single statement he says all day long, we should have a president that we can point to uh, children to and say, here's a model of character. And he lacks character, integrity, and any metric that you would hold up against him. Hmm. 
When I think about the history of the country, I think about many black men and women who have stood up for injustice and have raised their voices. We had Jesse Jackson here earlier this year. He's certainly ah. one of those people. So when you think about just people throughout history, it feels like black men and women haven't gotten the same love and respect that they deserve. How do we change those conversations, and how do we get to a point where everyone's just on equal footing? Do you think that's a possibility? I, I think it's a possible, but you, have to have, you must have the conversation. You have to have the uncomfortable conversation, right? Uh, Jesse Jackson is a model. He's mm -hmm. been around for over 50 years advocating. Still fighting. Uh, and still fighting. Yeah. Uh, uh, and calling and saying, mm -hmm. where are you? Because he's right. trying to tell me what to do yeah, at the same yeah. time. It's a beautiful <laughs> thing because we have many Jesse Jacksons. Mm -hmm. You know, he's one that has had the national stage. But from community to community, we have individuals who are continuing to push and fight. Uh, on last night, I was I was uh, privileged to be with some uh, SNCC activists mm -hmm. who have been around many years. And Judy Richardson, she made the comment. She says, I'm not going to give a young person my torch. I'm going to hold the torch, and I want them to hold it with me so we mm -hmm. can continue to, to run together. That makes sense. We should not have a us versus us generational argument. Young people can bring so much energy to the table. Some of our elders have so much wisdom. And when you partner that energy and that wisdom, you truly get a movement. All movements are intergenerational. And so for the African-American community, for the, for the broader community, let's start embracing all the individuals who truly make democracy work. Yeah, unity is so important because you think about what was happening in the 60s, the civil rights movement, very unique time. The fact yes. that things were able to get done there, extremely unique. And young people today, they're still able to make change, maybe not in the same way, but bridging that gap, I'm sure, is a major focus for you guys. It is not only a major focus, and when we look back, let's look forward, right? As we look back, say, okay, this were, these were some heroic individuals, but they were by far the minority. Mm. There are more young people engaged as activists now than it was then. And so we need to highlight the successes of uh, so many uh, uh, young people who are adding their voices. The beautiful thing about social media is a device that, that create instant reporters out of anybody who decide yeah. to capture and control the narrative. And we, we're seeing more and more young people engaging in that reality, particularly in their communities when injustice rears head. Yeah, especially with police brutality. We're Absolutely. seeing things that we didn't, weren't able to see before. And, and what, what a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, it certainly changes a lot of things. Yeah. Well, Derek, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Yes. That's Derek. I'm DJ. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.